Welcome to Qualified Opinions, where we test the ideas and limits, the knowns and known unknowns around freedom and order in contemporary politics and society. We invite you to listen as we engage with leading and emerging thinkers across disciplines and issues who will sharpen our thinking on the topics shaping our discourse. Forty-three states and the District of Columbia collect individual income taxes. The highest top income tax rate is found in California. This year, it stands at 13.3%, well above Arizona's and North Dakota's 2.5%. So how much tax is too much tax? What effect does such a high tax rate have on those living in the state? What incentives does it give to leave the state? When are taxes so high that they become counterproductive? These are some of the questions we'll explore with my guest today. Joshua Rao is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and a finance professor at Stanford University. Welcome, Josh. Thank you, Veronique. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm so glad you're here and we can talk about this issue. But before we do, I want I want to ask you, how how did you get to kind of work on these issues in particular and, and become an economist? Well, great, great question. Thanks very much. And uh, something I, I hope to inspire a lot of young people who are uh, listening to your podcast to do as well is to, uh, to to join us in 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 our field. I majored in economics as an undergraduate and I wasn't particularly inspired at that time to continue my uh, studies in, in economics. Uh, when I graduated I really wasn't thinking that I would go on to graduate school and, and get a PhD although I had done you know well enough in my classes and taken enough of the preparatory classes that it was still possible in the future if I if I so chose. Uh, I ended up working in the private sector for uh, for a couple of years. I, I worked at, at Goldman Sachs, where I did economic data and fiscal policy announcement analyses for the currency and bond traders. So it's a bit more of a sort of research arm of the of the firm back then. And 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 it was it was the combination of having had that undergraduate training in economics and then being uh, uh, in the in that practical real world setting where I. Became started to become interested in some of these issues uh, related to related to to, to, to government spending uh, and to the size of government, and so that was one of uh, several issues that I worked on during my PhD at, at, at MIT. I uh, also was very very interested in uh, in in pension funds and in in uh, retirement benefits that people get from companies and cities and states, and how those uh, benefits often have a really big uh, negative financial effect on these cities and states because they, they promise the people who work for them very, very large retirement benefits in the, in the future. And, and, and the, uh, they kick the can down the road, as they say, and that creates problems for their ability to fund critical services. And so we kind of saw a bunch of that during uh, some of the troubles that states had after the financial crisis, the bankruptcy of Detroit. Uh, and so putting all these issues together, I became very interested in the in the question of taxes, taxation, how taxation affects individual behavior, and 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 how it affects economic geography, people moving around, uh, and 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 how they make decisions about what kind of economic activity they're going to engage in. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. Weren't you a biology major originally? Not biology. I when I when I arrived at Yale as an undergraduate, I started out doing molecular biophysics and biochemistry. So so sort of uh, I guess that is you could call that bio biochem, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of, it's interesting. It seems that there's a lot of uh, I think John Cochran was a physics was he a physics major and and I know that Charles uh, Charles Blahaus here at Mercatus uh, he was he got a f- physics PhD I think I think uh, at at MIT uh, so it's kind of interesting to me I mean these are anecdotals but they are it doesn't seem to be that rare to find people we were who were in this so-called hard science and decide to actually shift use their background and then shift to economics. Well for me one of the deciding factors was that I really did not like working in the lab. I really did not like laboratory work. Uh, I I did very much like applying frameworks mathematical or simply rational frameworks to, to 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 try to solve problems, and and always had a real interest in in real world problems and and really kind of tangible things that you would read about in the newspaper every day. And so I think at some really basic level, the idea of being able to use these mathematical and rational frameworks to address topics, policy topics that you you read about every day, 
in the news to me was kind of what what uh, has gotten me, what attracted me to economics in the first place and, and really what's kept me interested in it over decades. Yeah, that's awesome. So you have an article with Ryan Shiu, I think, in the March issue of the American Economic Review. Congratulations, by the way. <laughs> and you guys are looking at the behavior of high-earning uh, households after California passed a 2012 initiative Prop 30 that significantly raised the top marginal tax rate on the highest earners. So can you, before we dive into the consequences and and your findings and your paper, can you kind of set for us the stage or basically tell us where in the the economic debate uh, is your paper? I mean, where would you set your paper in this economic debate? Be happy to answer that question. Before I do, I want to correct something you said, which is it's in the American Economic oh. Journal Economic Policy, AEJ Policy, not the American Economic Review. Uh, but uh, policy, uh, yes. But congratulations, but, but, anyway. <laughs> thank you. You know, we're, we're we're happy to happy to have it there as well. But yeah, so the so the um the uh in terms of the the economic debate, you know, as you mentioned, the the paper is about uh, looks at what happened when California raised its top marginal tax rate to. 13.3% from 10.3%. I don't know exactly what the geography is of your listeners. Some may be in, uh, in states and cities where the, uh, the, the tax rates are approaching those heights. Uh, others may be in places where they're a lot lower or even zero, like in Nevada or Texas or, or, or Florida. Yeah, I think there are seven states, right, that have zero seven states have income zero. tax, right? Yeah, and, and for those who have states, Arizona and North Dakota uh, have 2.5%. Uh, I mean, I, anyone who wants to know these numbers, just look at the Tax Foundation and look for a state income tax. They have just, they have like the latest data for 2024, so. Wow, those are some attractive numbers. Uh, California, since we wrote that paper, has now gone up to 14.4% because they uncapped a uh, payroll tax that had previously been, been capped. And uh, also since since uh, the, the time frame that we analyzed in that paper, the state and local tax deduction has been severely capped. So mm-hmm. the, the ability of people to deduct state and local taxes on their federal income tax return has been severely curtailed, which means that the actual brunt of the tax that you feel from being in a high tax state has gotten a lot higher. And the wedge between tax you pay if you live in California and Nevada has gotten a lot higher. So, so the capping of the deduction, the state and local tax deduction happened in 2017, at the end of 2017. I guess the first year was 2018. Exactly. It was a, it was a reform from the, the Trump tax cuts. Exactly. Right? Tax exactly. reform. And we have some follow-on work, actually, to the paper that you and I are discussing today. Follow-on work that actually looks at what the impact was of that cap on people's decisions of mm-hmm. where to live and, 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 and what economic mm-hmm. activity to engage in. But I think to go to your question about the broad sort of debate that this paper goes into. I I think part of the initial motivation was really about this question of just do people respond to taxes in terms of where they live? And and one one big element of the paper is looking at whether there are increases in people's tendencies to move out of California when the tax rate rose, in particular, whether people are most affected, were most likely to move. That's an interesting question, really important question. There's a great a literature about that and 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 an ongoing discussion about that factor and 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 how important it is. The other part of the paper that is equally important is the part of the paper that looks at how people change their behavior when the state increases taxes. In particular, how whether they they report less taxable income to tax authorities than they otherwise would. And I'll talk about how we sort of disentangle what their mm-hmm. counterfactual otherwise would would mm-hmm. be. But you need to look at both of those margins to be able to understand what the impact is of taxation on people's behavior. For the the press, the popular media, they like to have articles about, you know, okay, rolling up the moving vans, you know, the U-Hauls are are they're going yeah, yeah. empty to California and they're leaving full. That's very easy to explain to a large audience. But just as important, in fact, what we find in the paper, a more important margin on which people respond is you know, what businesses do you start? How, you know, for, for people who are who are high high earners, do, do they engage in economic activity that's going to generate even more income for them and also quite likely, you know, jobs for other people and economic activity more broadly? Do they engage in just as much or they engage in less now that that tax rate is higher? And so the economic debate that the paper enters into is one of 
of two questions. Number one is, what is the optimal size of government? That's a, that's a very broad and important question. And I think, you know, your listeners, if they're anything like uh, uh, my students or even my colleagues, are often surprised to hear just how big government has gotten in the United States in the era in which we live. In 2021, according to the OECD statistics, total government expenditures as a share of GDP in the United States of America overall was 44.9%. So that's federal, state, and local. Federal, state, and local all added together, Mm 44.9%. People often think of the United States as being this land of free market capitalism. But Mm -hmm. when, I mean, it's not an exaggeration to say that almost half of every dollar, you know, every dollar GDP is spent by the government in the United States, 44.9%. So it's gotten very big. Some of that, there was a, there was a spike up during, during COVID. Uh, I think when the 22 numbers are back in that 44.9% will have subsided to around 40%. It's still very, very large. And there's been a ratcheting up of that thing in every crisis the government spends more, and then it goes back a little bit, but doesn't get back to where it started. And they, and then it sort of flattens out for a while. And then, oh, another crisis, spend more, and then it doesn't go back to where they started. So that's one question of the economic debate that the paper addresses. I think the second is how big can government get uh, without distorting the economy, or you know, given the given the current size of government, how much distortion is there in the economy? Where do you say distortion? What does that mean? Why why is that bad? For the government to collect a dollar of tax revenue on anything, you know, they're going to, if we're talking about income in this paper. So if you tax income by a certain amount, the more you tax it, you have to expect that, that people's behavior is going to change. They might, le- they might leave the state. They might earn less income, choose to learn less income, choose not to start that business. And so those distortions have um, been a, a big topic of economic debate for, uh, for, for many years. And the profession has really swung in the direction of believing that those distortions are really pretty small. And, and so a lot of the work that is, that is out there uh, and that has come out in recent years has argued that distortions are so small that total tax rates, federal, state, and local tax rates in the, in the government could rise to be, the marginal tax rate could rise to be 80% or more, meaning the government could tax an additional dollar that I earn or that you earn at 80% or more without really reducing economic activity in any way. And, you know, that's a really strong claim. And that's a really high number. And that's been a number that's been thrown around as saying, hey, look, you know, we can just keep raising taxes to continue to fund this government spending. People are saying, oh, we can keep we can keep raising taxes to fund this level of government spending uh, or increase government spending. We can tax the rich, the high income people, and oh, they won't change their behavior very much. You know, maybe if we ta- if their tax rate goes over 85 percent, then there, these, this literature would say, you know, maybe at that point you're going to start to lose some income uh, for the government, but but that's a very very strong claim, and so that that is a claim that we that we very much revisit in this paper and find that the top rate that the government could tax without actually losing income is is much much lower, and that is much more in the range of of, of around thirty five to forty percent. Yeah, that's uh, it's it's great. So let's take actually the two uh, the two margins that the paper looks at. First, you know how how much do people move. So what what do you guys find? So one of the key challenges in uh, in the debate in in uh, in states about whether people respond in their moving behavior to taxes is that if you just kind of look across states, I mean, you know, some states have higher taxes than others. We, we, we talked about that. And in order to really identify causally some kind of effect of, of actual moving, you need to have a, a tax event. You need to have a big change. And so that so looking looking at this uh, ballot proposition in in in, in twenty twelve was passed effective twenty thirteen that raised that top rate from ten percent to thirteen percent was a great opportunity to say look at whether we see a spike in departures of people from California around that time another neat aspect of that setting is that the rate didn't only go from ten point three percent to thirteen point three percent which is an enormous in terms of percentage hike. It's like I haven't calculated, but it's 30%. yeah. Thirty percent. I mean, it's thirty percent. Thirty percent increase in, in your in your in your tax burden. It rose by different amounts for different people who were in different different income brackets. Yeah, so that was the top rate because California also has a bracket system. And California also has a bracket system, and so before this uh, this law went into place, it was the rate was nine point three percent if you were earning more than around fifty thousand uh, dollars 
um, up to a million dollars. And then after a million dollars, it was 10.3%. So $50,000, you were already taxed at 9.5%? It's around 50, yes, yes. Yeah, so it's it was pretty regressive Very regressive, then. yep, very regressive to begin with. And uh, well, they sure change. They sure increased the progressivity of the tax system yeah. by doing this change, but they didn't do it the way that I would have liked them to do it, which would have been to reduce tax rates. Yeah, of uh, you know, for for the for, for lower income people, uh, you know, in, instead they ra- you know raise tax rates on on, on higher income people, and, and so and so that those that nine point three and ten point three went into a you know a, a, a large, large number of brackets where you have nine point three, ten point three, eleven point three, twelve point three, thirteen point. Point, point three, depending on where you are relative to this $1 million cutoff. But what we see, I mean, the, the, the sort of baseline thing we see is that there is a large spike in, de- in the departure rate of, of California residents right around that change. I mean, it is the, yeah, if you look at, if you look at the first year of this, first year of this, of this change, that departure rate uh, w- went up, went up very dramatically. So, you know, the, the baseline rate that we were starting with was a rate of around 0.8% per year of high income individuals uh, leaving. And that rate, that rate doubled for the, for the, for the highest income, uh, highest income people. Uh, And, uh, and so um, for, and actually for very high income people, the, it, for those earning say more than $5 million room, actually California is a non-trivial number of people because there are a lot of, a lot of wealthy hiring people, the rate spiked from one and a half percent, in the year before to uh, around 2.2% uh, after the 2012 uh, uh, tax year. And so the evidence that this provided for this tax responsiveness of people to the, to the tax code is that not only was there a spike, but there was a greater increase in departures for people that were more affected by this tax rate increase. And so that, that's- So the, the, so the out-migration rate was significantly larger for as, as income went up. Exactly. The out-migration rate was significantly larger as income went up. Some other sub- sub- substantiating evidence I think is important is, you know, we also looked at where people moved to in, particularly yeah. in this year after this tax increase went into, went into place. And the big increases were in Nevada, Texas, and Florida, you know, zero mm-hmm. income tax states. So that substantiated mm-hmm. uh, the, the, the result. And another thing I should mention is we, we weren't the first people to look at this. Others had looked at it and had concluded that the effect had been very small. And Yeah, no, I remember yeah, that. And, the, and, and so, you know, one of the things we, we had to try to disentangle was what was going on. And it, it turns out that the other work that had been out there had made a fundamental error which is that it had not considered people who left California and then con- continue, continued to file tax returns as non-residents of California. It had not considered that out-migration. And those are situations mm-hmm. where we discover on average that the state loses over 90% of income. So let me, let me give an example. You know, a high-income person who moves uh, from California to, say, Texas or, New- or even to New York, it could be a high-tax state, whatever, who moves out, somebody's earning, say, you know, more than a million dollars a year. In order not to ever be part of the California tax system again, they have got it. You have to literally sever all ties with the state of California. And you can't actually, if you have any business income that you derive from living in California, then, uh, or from, from even being in California at any point in time, even if you live someplace else, you still have to file a California tax return. They don't tax that much your income, but you still have to file one. So, so part of the, the, my, the way that I actually saw this was back when I was a professor at Northwestern University uh, outside of Chicago in Evanston, Illinois, before I started this project, I, I went to California uh, once and I gave a, I gave a, a talk in California uh, and I uh, was there for, for a day and I got, I got paid a few hundred dollars for, for mm-hmm. doing this. And uh, at the end of the year, I, I discovered that I had to actually, I was sent a tax form, you know, 1099 type form discovery, I actually had to file tax return in California, even though I was living in Illinois and I had spent about three days of the year in, in, in California. So that fact that I had to file a tax return in California, even as a non-resident, that clued me in to the idea that the California tax authorities actually collect a lot of information about people who are not living in California. And also that you cannot conclude that just because somebody files in, continues to file a tax return in California after they left, that doesn't that doesn't mean that they haven't yeah. left. And, and the prior literature had gotten this wrong. They had basically misclassified people as not having left the state, even though they had left the state and uh, were filing as non-residents. So, so that was just an error in past research that we were able to correct. 
It's uh, it's interesting because uh, I also remember reading some uh, some literature back in the day where there were all these. Uh, I think it was during the Obama years where there were a lot of talks about out migration from high income states, and and I remember uh, reading some literature about the stickiness of places, and the idea that actually people were really reluctant to move between, let's say, the time where they started a family and the start time their kids went off to college. And as a result, there were just a lot of assumptions that that allowed, you know, uh, governments to basically abuse taxpayers more. But what you seem to be saying is like it's it's not the case. Uh, certainly it's it's hard. There's there's a point. There's a point where actually there's no stickiness to any places. Uh, if you if you hit people on the head enough and if they can move, they will move. That's that's right. And I think that one of the things that we've been seeing also in the data since since 2013 is that that stickiness for California has uh, really gotten un, kind of un, unhinged even even more. We saw in this follow up work, you know, we see spikes in departure rates for high income people after the federal government limited the that salt deduction, put that salt cap mm-hmm. in. Uh, state and local tax session cap in, which meant that all of a sudden there was a much bigger difference between the taxes I would pay in California versus living in Nevada or living in Florida, living in Texas. Big spike up there. And it, once again, the size of the spike was monotonically increasing with respect to how what tax bracket you were, you were in. And then during COVID, you know, there was another big spike of departure of people outside of California. This also was very much going up on the, on the income mm-hmm. tax scale. And we saw people go into places where there weren't as many restrictions on their activities particularly people with kids, uh, that really uh, dislodged the stickiness because all of a sudden, yeah. now the amenities that you thought you were paying for with your tax in California, you can't even send your kids to school. So, I mean, what's really the point of paying all those taxes? Yeah. And I, how do you disentangle the effect of the tax uh, with all the other things like regulation and spending and, and, and all of this? Because you would expect a state... That is so, I mean, that's just willing to pass such high increase in, 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 in tax and in marginal tax rates. They're not getting it right otherwise, right? So is can you disentangle basically by actually looking at the lower income people who may not who are not affected by this type of of, of tax increases, but are really actually feeling the, the brunt of everything else. Exactly right. So that's exactly what we do. We, we break people down by the bracket they were in before the before the tax event happened. And then we look at at the at the changes in behavior. And, you know, the people who are in the nine point three percent bracket, that's a flat line. There's no there's no change there. And then as you go up the brackets, there are increasing magnitudes of changes. You go to the people who got hit by the by the increase to ten point three, hit by the people who get in, in, hit by the increase to eleven point three. And and so on. And so that's really the the that's that's the, uh, the the methodology that we use. Now, going to the other part of it, the, the the part which is the changes in economic activity to people who stay, this turns out to be very very important. And and again, the way that we that we are able to disentangle that their behavior from others is fortunately once again anybody who has any kind of even even a slight amount of income in California has got to file a California income tax return because this paper is really about the behavior of high earners. We had a really, really robust control sample of people who aren't living in California, but who spend a few days in California or do something in California that requires them to file a California tax return. And, you know, Sometimes people say, well, why are you focusing on these high earners? You know, there there are these lower income people who, who come to California. I mean, before this tax policy change in 2013, the top 1% of taxpayers in California paid 40% of the taxes. Afterwards, they paid over 50% of the taxes. So, you know, focus, focusing on high earners it is, is, is justified. And, you know, if I don't have the stats for California at the top of my head, but, you know, if you, if you go to the, to the federal level and you look at federal, federal taxes, you know, the top 1% pays about 45% of taxes and the top 5% pays about 60, 65% of taxes. So, uh, you know, if you want to know how much revenue you're going to be able to collect or, or what, how, you know, what's going to happen to the economy if you increase taxes, you kind of, you have to really pay attention to those people. Yes. So let's, let's, uh, first, first I want to say before we talk to the people who stay and change their behaviors, which that is, as I think is, is also like really the fascinating part of the, of the paper. I want to tell you, I mean, 
for the last 10 years, I think I've been very disillusioned with uh, with the system we have. And I was thinking, you know, we have a federal system, but federalism only works if there's actually a significant difference between states. And I thought, I wonder, and I never looked into this, but this is what I was thinking. I was thinking, like, what difference really does it make where you live if, like, basically the biggest bill, your biggest tax bill you pay is the federal bill, where uh, you, the biggest regulations and the biggest is, I, I, and I thought I thought that basically it was very likely that federalism was very, very uh, diminished because of the size of federal government. But but I think kind of like what, what your paper shows is that it's not so much, or maybe it is that the federal government has grown so much. And when you have states who on top of it add enough state income tax, then like it all, I mean, federalism matters a great, great deal. It does. You know, we, I mean, compared to uh, most of the rest of the world, we have a relatively decentralized system in the sense that, you know, about two thirds of the government spending is, is done uh, uh, by the by the federal government, you know, most most places it's much more centralized. Of course, there are countries in the world like Switzerland where the, the federal or the you know central government of Switzerland is only spending about one third of the of the of the money. And I I do think our uh, results suggest that these differences can be big. I mean, look, if you're talking about paying what was now fourteen point four percent of an additional dollar that you earn if you stay in California versus zero percent if you move to Texas or Florida. I mean, that's a... Well, especially if it's on top of the, the federal... On top the of, federal, right, you're already paying, the, right, you might already be paying 37, 40, 39. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so on, you know, that's a big difference, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and, and I think that uh, the, you know, the, the movements of people that we've seen in, the, in, in, you know, in the last few years in particular, as I said, I think, I think COVID really, uh, COVID and the sort of work from home revolution kind of created this idea that, there are a lot of there is a lot of productive activity that people can do, you know, may, maybe not living where living near their work or or being in an, in their office every day. Not all of it, and some of this is, is, has come back, and there's been a backlash. But certainly, the means, the ability to uh, live someplace else and to be more footloose, I think, has increased very much, just through the realization from from COVID when all of a sudden, due to the lockdowns. Uh, people were forced to start doing things online. A lot of people realized from that, well, hey, gee, actually, there's a lot of my life I can do online. I, I hope people also realize there's a lot of your life you can't do online, though, too. Um, and uh, lockdowns really, uh, I think, had a major negative psychological impact on a lot of people, but that's a story for another day. Yeah. So let's let's talk about the people who stayed. And and this this I'm really I'm really interested in in large part we've hinted at because because the previous literature uh, uh, a lot of the conclusions was you know there's just not that much of an effect. Basically, you can raise rates uh, fairly high and and get very minor change change in behaviors. And so that led people like uh, AOC, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, and and others. Uh, pushed by a trio of French economists to say, you know, the 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 top marginal rate could be the the, uh, the optimal, and which meant the maximum, even though it's really not the same, is seventy three percent. That you can go and raise the top marginal rate to seventy three percent. And obviously, I think it's not it's not correct. But your research really shows that actually people are reacting. A, a fair, I mean, and it is really the. It seems to be the biggest, the biggest margin along which. People re- respond. Yeah, and I, I think you know to, to say a bit more about about the sort of framework that people think about this. And the, the question that this this uh, kind of tax policy research literature has been asking is, what is the highest tax rate that we can set, and still have the government be able to collect income? That's the in- in- revenue. That, be able to collect revenue. That, that's the, that's the question that they're uh, that they're that they're asking. It's 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 equivalent to asking what's the top of the Laffer curve. You know, the Laffer curve is this, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the famous curve initially drawn on a napkin by Art Laffer that said there is some tax rate above which the government won't be able to collect any more revenue because there'll be so much distortion that you know uh, that they that you know people's behavioral choices to work less will just make it counterproductive. And you can think about, if you have trouble thinking about that, uh, we always just tell people, imagine if there were a 100% tax rate. You know, nobody would would work. I mean, there would be no work. So obviously, mm-hmm. and the government would collect no revenue. Now, that 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 the reason I want to say this is that that discussion, it is actually a pretty narrow discussion when you think about it. I mean, 
Why? And, and in fact, the, the people who have been writing this literature in recent in recent years and decades have been very smart in calling this rate the quote unquote optimal top marginal tax rate. Is the optimal yes. top marginal tax rate is eighty two percent? I mean, why should the benchmark be the rate? Oh, which, is it eighty two percent now? Yeah, 80, I think that was one of the numbers. Eighty two percent. Yeah. Well, you know, why should the benchmark be the rate at which you can't squeeze any more money out of the economy? What is that? What kind of benchmark is that? And we we lost something in the last couple of decades because in the late in the 1990s, Martin Feldstein came along. He kind of pioneered the idea that the elasticity of taxable income, well-known Harvard economist, the elasticity of taxable income was an important measure of the efficiency of a tax system. And he wrote a, a, a very famous paper in the late 1990s where he calculated that that the federal tax system was such that for every dollar of tax raised by the federal government, that there was at least a dollar and perhaps up to two dollars of loss economic activity or distortion, distortionary losses, deadweight loss mm-hmm. as a result of it. And so asking the question, where is the top of the Laffer curve? I mean, you know, I, I've gotten into that debate as well. And, and yeah, I'll say the top, they say the top of the Laffer curve is 82 percent. I think it's broke down by 35 or 40 percent based on what our research shows. But we've also ceded a lot of ground by uh allowing that to be, uh, allowing them to define the terms of the debate at that. I mean, the top, how high can you raise the tax rate so that you literally could not squeeze another dollar out of the economy even more? I mean, calling that the optimal marginal tax rate is pretty rich. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I absolutely agree. And it's, it really kind of tells you the mindset. Actually, there's, I think we're going to be talking a lot about this because uh, uh, last week I talked with uh, Adam Michelle and we were talking about the conversation about whether we were going to have uh, to raise taxes and put revenue on the table to address our debt problems. And, and there too, the conversation is really taking place as what is the role, what is the size of government? What, what should it be first, which is the, really the conversation we should be having? Or what should these programs do in the case of Social Security and Medicare? Is there actually a sense that Social Security, which was supposed to be for, you know, uh, uh, poor people when they retired at a time where there was no capital markets that made uh, seniors overrepresented in the top income quintile, right? Uh, is it still, does it still make sense that we have Social Security today? I don't think so. I mean, we could have we could have a needs based program but and but we are not having these conversation we're kind of like this is we want this big size of government and then you know we're going to have to uh, to raise a lot of, uh, of of taxes and it seems to be taken for for granted that's right and and you know th- there's no sense in which we should as to the tax policy should be targeting trying to get to a tax rate that's the top of the laffer curve i mean that that's that's not what we should be trying to do. I mean, what that, that's a terrible tax policy goal, we, you know, because, because as you say, the, 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 the primitive that we need to that we need to uh, we need to agree on is how big should government be? How much of the economy should government control? So I'm sorry for that tangent, but I did want to say that. Because no, no, I, I think it's important. And, and in fact, I was very happy at the beginning of the podcast when you talked about the paper and you said that the first thing that you you guys looked at is what is the size of government? I thought, yeah, yeah. So what, what we do on this, uh, this economic activity margin is we are, be, be, because of the richness of the data we have, and I should mention, this is administrative data, we, we are able to obtain the entire universe of, of tax filings from the California uh, tax authorities, the Fra- Franchise Tax Board, de-identified and anonymized. And, we, and so that, that's the data set for this, for this entire, entire exercise. Uh, and, and so we're able to compare uh, someone who is a high earner in California to someone who is earning that same amount, lives in another state, but only uh, but files a tax return in California because they received a de minimis or a, just a small amount mm-hmm. of taxable income in California. So we're able to compare those two people. And, and what we see is those two people, their earnings are evolving in very, very parallel ways. We call parallel trends, very, very parallel ways during the years preceding this tax policy change. And then there's this very, very large divergence between between the, 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 the two of them. So, so we're able to establish these natural control groups of people who are living in other states, particularly in other high tax states. And we observe this, this, this very big, very big divergence, which translates into uh, what we call the elasticity of taxable income. We're finding a number for that that's around 3.0. 
So meaning. Oh, so that's significantly like it's like 300 times more than what, what was it? Was it 0. 0.1 to 0. 0.1 to 0. 0.5 is what the mainstream public finance economists will tell you, who, who will also tell you that the top the revenue maximizing marginal tax rate is 82%. Yeah, yeah. That's what they will tell you is 0. 0.1 and 0. 0.5. So, so um, you know, one important question is, well, why do you get such different results? We are able, again, we're looking at, this is the impact on high earners, who, uh, and the group of high mm-hmm. earners, they essentially pay half or more of the income taxes. And uh, and so the other studies that have been out there, a lot of these elasticity taxable income, they come from things like middle-income Danish people who see a, you know, one couple percent because a lot of it's dangerous a lot of the data is uh in these other studies is from scandinavia because they have really good data but that's not that that's not going to tell you what happens if you raise the top marginal tax rate on the most productive high earning members of of the united states economy and that's what our experiment uh allows you to do and, and that's and that's why we're able, that's why we're able to have a setting where we're able to we have the power and the ability to to detect these changes so, so the elasticity of taxable income is is really high. It means people actually react, respond way more to to higher taxes than than we thought. And that reminds me, at the beginning of the pandemic, I got an email from Chris Edwards, who is a, a you know a, a tax policy person at the Cato Institute. And I remember that email where he said he said, "Huh, let's see the states not learning against the lesson that relying so much on the income tax is a terrible idea." And and, uh, and so I was thinking about this, uh, about this, and I, I went and looked, and it's uh, the Tax Foundation says that individual income taxes are a major source of state government revenue. That's 30% of state tax collections in fiscal year 2022. And so that kind of got me thinking that it just seems really not really safe to be actually relying so much of the income tax when you have first, I mean, it, it's it. it We've learned through recessions that actually income tax base is the first to go during a recession. But but now with your data, it seems really to be a v- even less safe move. Yeah, that's right. And and you know the state of California has made some n- noise about this. Even 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 Gavin Newsom has said that the state of California is is too is taking too big a risk by relying so much on the income tax. Uh, that it creates taxes that are. Uh, uh, tax system is just too too volatile, and you know his government is living that in real time now as they face a budget deficit of more than seventy billion dollars. Because you know boom times are great for California, bust not as much. California makes it even worse, by the way, by taxing capital gains at the ordinary tax rate. So oh, wow. um, that makes it even more even more uh, uh, sensitive to um, uh, to what's going on in the economy. Uh, but you know, I mean, our our elasticity of taxable income, an elasticity of taxable income of three point using the kind of standard uh, Peter Diamond Emanuel Saez formula, translates into a top marginal tax rate, revenue maximizing marginal tax rate of only 18%. Now that's, you know, that that's for the people who are treated by our experiment. I think you can you know, put in, put in um, some other things there, but obviously the revenue maximizing marginal tax rate is way lower than what people are saying. ELCs of tax income are far higher. And, and also as a matter of state policy, as you're saying, uh, by loading up so much on such a risky setup, you're you're setting yourself up for uh, for 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 real problems if the stock market doesn't continue to crank out high returns. And you know this this is a refrain that I, I say a lot. But if if you go back to the uh, uh, 2009 2010 after the financial crisis, the S and P 500, the main stock market index, it had gone down to around 800. It's now at 5,000. And so. And in a you know if, if you thought that it was hard to achieve a you know a, a balanced budget if you had a, a system where it's heavily heavily loaded on cap, collecting capital gains tax if you thought it was hard when the stock market is skyrocketing by you know a factor of six <laughs> over a decade it's going to be even harder much harder if it's not if we don't get a repeat performance that's something that pension funds should also take note of. One of the things that I also think about that probably we don't talk enough about is is so how many people are dissuaded to come to California. I mean, California used to be the place where you would go if you wanted to be a movie star or a director or or a tech giant or whatever. But I, it's got to, 
it's it's got to dissuade people. And then the other aspect of it is I remember a paper from, I don't know, 2010 or 2011, Michael Strain and, and Aparna Mampour, and there was someone else I can't remember, so I apologize. But they looked at actually the decision that high marginal tax rates, the, the change in behavior in career choices that people made. And, and, and they found that basically the person would decide to become uh, not a surgeon because if you're going to be taxed at a super high income, you might as well do something that is just not as stressful and you'll become a pediatrician, which is great. It's a great job, but it's not, you know, it's, and so these choices, I mean, they, they really take place and ultimately they really impose a real cost. They impose a real cost on society because we need people to be incentivized to engage, to go into careers that are uh, that may be very, very demanding, but may have very high rewards because they want to be able to to, to reap the fruits of, of of the of the investment in their human capital that they have made. I think it's a major mistake to ignore that margin in setting tax policy. And our current uh, system, you know, we the paper that we've discussed today focuses a lot on these high earners who, as I as I said, you know, pay a huge share of the of the income taxes. Uh, you know, who are the lower earners? A lot of the lower earners are also people who are maybe earlier in their careers or haven't earned, earned a lot or trying to decide what, you know, what, what, what types of human capital to, to invest in. And uh, having such a huge disincentive to invest in human capital is, is really dangerous. And I, I should add that, you know, the government welfare programs that lower income people are, are, are eligible for, including, you know, the various uh, Affordable uh, Care Act uh, subsidies, Medicaid, you know, all the expansions of the safety net and during COVID-19 and more. I mean, these created even larger disincentives uh, to, uh, you know, to earn income, to to get out of poverty, to invest in human capital. And I I think this has been a terrible policy direction for our country. Isn't that like the big idea behind the Prescott paper? Is that if you... I mean, the, uh, if you want to know what the disincentive to work is from from higher taxes, is actually if you if you give a lot of money to people, then that's really you know that it has a big it has a big it creates a big disincentive to work when you have when you pair those two things, as a, and it's it was less obvious when uh, if the money was just you know just burned wasted in some boondoggle or whatever. Right. Yeah. So I know that. If I remember correctly, in the, at the end of the paper, you don't talk about the budgetary. You don't. You don't say you can say for sure what the budgetary impact on the paper is. Well, we we do we do say that the uh, behavioral response eroded forty five percent of the state's expected windfall tax revenue within the first year, and sixty one percent within two years. Uh, and and so you know, top of the Laffer curve would be, you know, 100% of that. And we, if you keep going out, you know, a lot of people say, well, can you keep going out over how, you know, eventually maybe over more years, you might get even higher amounts of erosion, which is true. Of course, over more years, you know, your, your, your identification strategy isn't quite as tight. You can't follow these people as well. But what, what we also are able to do is we do a, a kind of thought experiment of, okay, you know, starting, if, starting five years after this tax increase, when they capped the, the the state and local tax deduction, if you look at that and you you model what the actual tax rate is now that uh, that people face, where is California uh, on the Laffer curve at that point? Uh, and and given that now that state and local taxes are no longer fully or for for these high income people essentially not deductible against your your federal mm-hmm. uh, taxable income, California is essentially over the top of the Laffer curve. Because we found such large effects, even at a time when the the federal government, the other taxpayers out there in other states were bearing half the burden for you. Now, <laughs> that's no longer the case. And so if we found such strong responses back then, uh, what level of response would we expect to find if California raises these rates again by a similar amount? We would expect to find responses that are uh, you know that are that are that are larger you know, by by a factor of roughly two. So so we do conclude that that at this point California would actually bring in more revenue by cutting taxes. Yeah. So we are we are on the on that other side of the Leifer curve. Yes. So it's like it also explains why I mean it's the uh, the legislators from New York and California and New Jersey are very very active trying to demand the end of the uh, the salt cap 
basically. And I, I, I hope they fail, but I'm, I'm, uh, I mean, I hope they fail as well. I mean, uh, obviously, you know, for, for my own personal tax situation, if they succeeded, it would be good, but I don't care about that. I care about, uh, it, it's very, it's, it's, it's outrageous of me to ask taxpayers in other states to subsidize the profligate spending of California, which spends billions and billions and billions of dollars on all kinds of programs and activities that are just pure, pure waste. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm working on some other projects right now. Where we're trying to track where uh, pandemic, where f- fiscal policy, fiscal aid from the from the pandemic actually went uh, when it, it went, when it goes to states, what do states do with it? Oh, yeah, I saw you have a paper with uh, Stan Berger and someone else. Exactly, I can't Jeff remember Clemens who that was. And, 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 and Oliver Gisico, who's a research fellow here. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, we, we find that, I mean, some of it goes into funding pensions. A lot of it goes into a category called general government, which is a category where when you try to disentangle what's in there, you just find this incre- this just wild, wildly complex mass of, of, of bureaucratic nonsense. And uh, my favorite anecdote from this is digging into the California general government category. And again, general government excludes things like education, health, the standard uh, categories. You dig into general government, you see that the biggest, uh, one of the, 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 the category that's most responsible for variation in that is something called various departments. Various <laughs> departments sounds like a Kafkaesque bureaucracy of some kind. How much how much money, by the way, are we talking for uh, talking about? Because I mean, it's, I think it's worth rem- remembering that like there were hundreds of billions of dollars uh, from the CARES Act and the different uh, COVID relief bills that were went to giving money to the states, and that's what we're talking about. So for California, how much are we talking about? Well, I don't have the number the top, off the top of my head as to how much money went to uh, uh, went to California, but what I can tell you is that. You know, this budgetary item, various departments is, you know, is is the one that's responsible for the variation in general government. This and this is a number that is uh, in as of uh, I think it was the 2022, 2023 year is amounts to almost eight billion dollars of money just going to eight billion dollars wow. for a state. I mean, you know, for the federal government, maybe you say that's small for a state. Uh, I mean, that, that that's pretty substantial. And it was zero before covid. So, I mean, you got you just have, you know. Billions and billions of dollars just that you can't even trace. So, is this? Do you think it's a slush fund? Do you think it's what? It what is it? Or just we just don't know what I it think is. At this point, we just don't know what it is. But I, I think it's a it's a uh, it's a I don't know what the, the legal definition of slush fund is. But it's a it's yeah. it's going to a yeah. wide range of bureaucratic uh, activities that it's very very hard for us to for us to. It's know kind of about. interesting because it's not they're not using it to pay down. Well, I guess you said some of it is going to their no, pension going fund. To pensions. But but uh, if I remember the the literature from the the Great Recession, right? Uh, and a reason one of the reasons why multipliers are usually very low, it's because when people feel their net wealth has has gone down quite dramatically, instead of buying stuff and consuming, what they do is to save the money they receive from the government. And so um, it's that's not what California is doing. That's not what California is doing, right? That and and uh, they are finding ways of 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 using using the money. That's 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 for sure. And you know, some of it finds way into pension funding, which is not actually allowed by the bills that that uh, authorize mm-hmm. this this spending. And we also find some evidence that the, the states that are that are using it for pension funding are also increasing pension benefits to some extent too. So it's not yeah. only paying down debt. So yeah, Adam and I talked about this about like some of the risk uh, that go to actually caving on putting revenue on the table. And one is like there's a there uh, this study by Richard Vedder that shows that actually when you raise taxes in the name of reducing the debt or paying down the debt, uh, you find that actually not only do you not most of the money goes not just to not reducing the debt, but to increasing spending. And so that was actually a question I was going to ask you, whether you there's always promises about how much a given tax increase is going to raise. And obviously, I assume they're probably using the elasticity, the very weak elasticities. And so they're always assuming that they're going to be raising way more money. And in the, the previous, like the, the 2004 uh, tax increase in California, 
academia, right? It was supposed to be going to uh, to mental health to fund the money raised. It was going to mental health. Do you know uh, on the top of your head whether, one, they raised as much money as they thought they were going to raise and whether actually the money did go to, you know, improving mental services for whatever that means? Well, one of the challenges in trying to answer the question, did they raise as much as they thought they were going to raise, is the, all the other stuff that's going on in the background. So, yeah. so, so, for example, taking our setting, where we find that 60% of the windfall gain was was eroded within within two years, 60% of what you would expect to gain was eroded. What you'd expect to gain is calculated just by taking the 3% of additional uh, percentage points of additional taxable revenue, multiplying it by taxable income. Assuming zero. Assuming zero behavior response. And what the state will tell you is they'll say, you know, we achieved our revenue targets and more. And why was that? Well, that's 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 because the economy was growing. The question is not what happened ex post. The question is the what would how much would you have brought in if there hadn't been this behavioral response? And uh, and so and so th- that's where you see these very big gaps. As for whether the the mental health services uh, tax was ultimately, uh, whether you can observe that that ultimately fundamental. There are people looking into this, and I think there's some real questions as to whether it has or it hasn't. If this is the counterfactual from actually having a tax, 1% of high-income earners tax devoted to mental health services, it's a, it's a uh, pretty shocking commentary on the current state of affairs because, obviously, just walk around any city in California and you, you're going to see uh, people suffering from major mental health problems. I, I don't know whether the problem is more uh, one of uh, lack of resources or whether it's a, there's a fundamental legal and philosophical uh, uh, set of issues related to how to, uh, how to address situations where people are, are addicted to drugs and are on the street. Uh, and uh, and w- what is the, the, the appropriate way as society to, to, to deal with it? But I, I think there's a sense that the mental health services tax revenue did not go exactly to that planned purpose. Mm-hmm. I have a, I have one final question. So uh, what is the most mistaken claim you'd like to correct about this research, either about things that people have said since your paper has been out? By the way, who and that paper has been really well covered. I've I've uh, I've seen it you know, mentioned all over the place. So again, congratulations on this. So either something that people have said or, or about, about the, the, the theme in particular. Well, I mean, I think the number one uh, thing is that you, you know, you, there's an assumption that you can simply tax the rich and tax higher income people. And that's the way that, that you can solve all of our, you know, societal problems. And I think what we learned from the research is that, uh, that it, first of all, to a large extent, much of the higher income uh, distribution is basically already tapped out in a sense, and and also I think, and again, this goes back to the sort of terms of the debate. More importantly, you know, it's not the question that we should be asking is not how can we squeeze an additional dollar uh, out of high income people. It's how do we set up a system where we're going to generate the most prosperity for 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 everyone. Hiring, you know, higher income people, you know, there's this idea that you can out there, and this is the idea I think is that we need to address and, and should be dispelled, is that you can just tax them more without having any consequences. That redu- that reduction in economic activity that they will have, even if you're able to squeeze another dollar out of them, that reduction in economic activity means fewer jobs, it means less economic activity, it has greater consequences for the for the economy. And so I think uh, the, the tax income assistance that we measure, that really, that summarizes what that, what that economic loss is. And that's super important. I think the final thing I'll just say, you know, in terms of mis- misperceptions, and one thing that I, I hope your listeners will will uh, consider and look up is just these questions of um, just how much taxes higher income people actually pay. I mean, if you ask Americans uh, whether uh, they think that the wealthy pay their fair share in taxes, uh, I mean, uh, may, six in ten Americans believe that upper income people pay too little in taxes. That's you know, standards or Pew uh, research uh, polls. But when you actually confront them with statistics about how much of income these high income earners earn and how much of the taxes they pay, they're often quite surprised. The top 1% earn 26% of adjusted gross income in the United States of America. This is federal taxes we're talking about now. They pay 46% of the federal income tax. So that 
for most people, they would say, hmm, okay, well, I thought they were paying their fair share. I mean, it sounds like they're paying their fair share and a lot more. So I think that's another, yeah, maybe that's a set of topics on inequality that also need to be addressed in a separate uh, uh, episode of your podcast. But um, I, I really feel that that's another uh, kind of basic facts area where uh, people need to um, uh, should, should really uh, look, look at what the facts are. Well, thanks so much, Josh. This was great. Thank you, Veronique. It was great being with you. And uh, I really appreciate your having me on the show. Absolutely. Absolutely. 